Good afternoon to those of us joining us from Africa, Middle East, and Europe, and good morning to our U US participants, and particularly good morning to one of our panelists who is actually joining us from Boston. So uh, thank you everybody for joining us. So my name is Eric Berghoff. I'm the chief economist of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or AIIB. You all very Welcome to join this webinar. It's a collaboration between the AIB, the Center for Economic Policy Research in London and the London School of Economics. And this time we are also joined by the OECD. So on the occasion of their annual uh, multilateral development finance report, they organized a marathon around the world. So this is sort of the Asia leg of that around the world marathon. Uh, and. Uh, we decided to join forces with this uh, regular webinar, which we call the Global Commons Room, uh, where we discuss the global challenges and, and how research across disciplines and of diff from different parts of the world can generate progress on the global common challenges. This event also marks uh, the two year anniversary of the presentation of the final report from the G20 eminent persons group of, on global financial governance. That report concluded 18 months of intense work uh, that was led by uh, then uh, Deputy Prime Minister Tharman Shanmugaratnam, and I had the pleasure to be part of, of that work. Uh, the report outlines an ambitious agenda of uh, reforms. It has 22 proposals and additional sub proposals. Uh, for how to strengthen the development finance architecture and how to create a stronger global financial safety net and also for how to bring them closer together. And in the end, this is very much about, uh, about governance, about how we can govern the system in a way so that makes the system function as a system. And in the end, these international financial institutions have more or less the same shareholders, the slightly different constellations and different um, uh, weighting and so on. But if we could really pull them together and we could view these uh, balance sheets as, as uh, common, uh, we could create a much more uh, effective and efficient system. And uh, we could bring down borrowing costs, we could move uh, more uh, larger volumes of capital to uh, developing countries. And if you could coordinate operations better, uh, we could also get more uh, value for money. Uh, if we could standardize operations, maybe we could make progress on, on uh, securitizing uh, uh, operations and, and again, improve uh, the quality and, and, the, and lower the costs of what is being done. All that uh, was very much part of the agenda that the, the eminent uh, persons group um, uh, put together. Of course, COVID-19 has tested the system harder than anyone, I think, could have anticipated when the report was written. I remember we, we discussed at the time very much uh, the possibility of pandemics, but for all of us, I think this has been a, a wake up call uh, in terms of, of course, the medical uh, aspect and, and the, the tragedies that we have seen, but also in terms of the economic and, and uh, social and political impact. And for many countries, particularly in the emerging and developing world, those impacts have been a, at least as grave as, as the medical um, uh, emergency. So we think that now is a is sort of good time to take stock of what where we are on this reform agenda and, and how did the system uh, fair in, in this uh, test, uh, if you want. Uh, obviously, in the midst of, 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 of a pandemic, we have to address the medical emergency. And, and un until we have dealt with the medical emergency, we are not going to, to really uh, get back the economy to the level of activity it had before the pandemic. So, but I think for, for us tonight is to ask the question, how has the system stood up to this test? Uh, and when it came both to the dealing with the medical emergency and to the economic and, 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 and the social impact, how has, has it uh, responded? Uh, 
I think you can say that the system has not um, collapsed and, and uh, you know, individual institutions have managed to deliver meaningful responses, but it's, is it strong enough to cope with what we have in front of us in terms of economic, social, political impact? Will it be strong enough to deliver uh, vaccines to, to everybody around the world? And can we say that the system is really functioning as a system? I think these are some of the questions we will talk about tonight. The OCD report uh, points to a tendency towards what they call a la carte multilateral, that uh, individual donors push their specific agendas and in that way sort of undermines the, um, the accountability of the multilateral system as a whole and transferring control to a group of, of large donors. The, the report also expresses concerns that the multilateral system as a whole will not be able to generate sufficient funding. I think that's something that we should uh, talk about tonight as well. We, we know that already uh, the resources of these institutions are, are um, stressed. And uh, the report also points to some research, which I think we should take into account, that the, when you look at compare multilateral institution and bilateral institutions, that actually the multilateral institutions perform better on, on almost all um, uh, dimensions. And in particular, it, it is more, has stronger specialized skills, make more use of government channels and, and in that way, um, sort of trains and educates uh, and, uh, and makes government function better. It is more effective in reaching fragile environments. So we should uh, think about uh, these issues when we uh, talk about the division of labor between multilateral and, and bilateral institutions. And the OECD report ends with, uh, I think, a very important remark that, you know, as we try to build back better our economies and uh, we should also think how we can build back better the existing multilateral uh, aid architecture. So with those initial words, I, I wanted to uh, set the stage for, for the discussion tonight. So we have an absolutely fantastic panel to discuss these issues. And um, I will introduce the speakers as I give them the floor, but they have all worked at the highest levels of government and represent different perspectives uh, on these issues. So after they have presented their initial remarks, we will invite the audience to pose questions and, and you can do so on the Q&A and by raising uh, your hand. So without further ado, I wanted to give the floor to uh, Tharman Shanmagaratnam, the former deputy prime minister, now senior minister of Singapore. He led the D20 eminent persons group for global financial governance. Probably this is the most ambitious process of rethinking the global financial system that was ever undertaken by looking at the entire system, not only the development architecture or not only the, the financial safety net, but putting them together. As he's still very much in, engaged in building support for the systemic approach that the eminent persons group took and for the specific uh, proposals it made. So, Mr. Minister, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, uh, thank you to the OECD, CEPR, um, LSE and AIIB for bringing us together. Thank you for inviting me to join you especially. Um, uh, let me start uh, by way of um, uh, preamble to just say that we have to recognize the both the scale as well as the urgency of the situation we face. Um, and it's not so much, it's not merely about, you know, what type of recovery we're going to see, whether it's L-shaped or U-shaped or V-shaped. We have to realize that the setback this year alone is not just a short-term setback, but it places us on a new trajectory going forward. Uh, all previous crises, including the global financial crises, show that it takes a long time to recover from the setback in levels of output and employment, even if you have a resumption of growth subsequently. And this is particularly important in the developing world, uh, particularly the young developing world, because it is levels of output that we need to regain in order to generate the jobs required for a large youthful demographic. And if we don't see 
urgent scaled up action in the next one to two years, uh, we are going to face a very serious economic, social, and global political problem in the next decade. The next two years are critical for the next decade and beyond. I think it is uh, uncontentious to recognize that the scale of financing that is now required for the developing world, both the low income, lower middle and middle income countries is now much larger than we would have envisaged even a year ago, uh, let alone over the last, let alone what we have seen over the last decade or two. Um, we now need a much larger scale of financing. It will require domestic reforms and domestic revenue systems to be improved, but those things cannot be done quickly. And secondly, from a, a counter-cyclical point of view, this is not the best time for governments to be raising more revenues. You can plug leakages, but you shouldn't be raising taxes at this point. Uh, there can be efforts to develop domestic capital markets and to mobilize savings better. Again, that takes time. That's a longer term journey, which many countries are on. And I think the MDBs have been playing a very useful role in facilitating. But there's no uh, beating around the, the, the main issue, which is that we need a much larger scale of external financing for the developing world. And we have to treat this as a matter of urgency. The net new financing needs are very large compared to what we've seen before. The MDBs uh, have more potential than has been realized so far. They have a tremendous multiplicative potential. And we have to see over the next two years how we can firstly increase the amount of resources available to the MDBs. Secondly, allow for those resources to be multiplied and deployed in a more coordinated and in a much tighter fashion. So it's more resources, better multiplication of resources, but very importantly, deploying resources in a coordinated fashion so that the comparative advantages of the different institutions, and this was highlighted in the OECD report as well, uh, quite apart from being a major theme of the G20 Eminent Persons Group report, this ability to leverage on comparative advantages and different skill advantages of the different MDBs is, is a major opportunity. Uh, I think the uh, capital issue, uh, when you look at it realistically, does not involve numbers that major shareholders should balk at. The amount of resources required to replenish capital in the MDB system as a whole, it doesn't apply equally to all the MDBs, but if you take the system as a whole and look at the scale of new net financing required for the, the developing world, the amount of resources you we need to replenish in the MDBs is very, very small compared to the resources being deployed domestically. Um, in each of the economies of um, the major and even moderately sized uh, shareholders. So we're not talking about huge amounts of money. This is actually a feasible plan. Secondly, we are making some progress in better coordination between the MDBs. We weren't stand, starting from scratch. There's been work in, over the last several years and even work on the country platforms recommendations of the G20 uh, EPG report has been progressing under the Japanese and Saudi presidencies. Um, it's, it, you know, the G20 doesn't change the world overnight, but they've been making good progress. But very importantly, we have to think about private investment. And that means not only uh, using MDB resources to catalyze private investment rather than to lend those resources outright on the MDB's balance sheets, in other words, using loan loss guarantees, using a variety of ways of mitigating risk for the private sector. But it also means tapping on the very large quantum of institutional investor funds in the system and developing an asset class. And this is not new. We've been talking about this for some time. It is entirely doable. Developing synthetic asset classes of developing country infrastructure with underlying assets being developing country infrastructure, but sufficiently diversified, sufficiently simple, and on a scale that will attract the institutional investor uh, class, which is very large. 
I do want to emphasize that the next year may very well see um, some major corrections in asset values in the largest capital markets of the world. Uh, if you talk to seasoned long-term investors, most of them have as um, at least one scenario, if not their baseline scenario, a major correction in markets. Um, and that's going to make it even more difficult to be able to mobilize private institutional investor capital. We've got to find ways of mitigating risk in the developing world, simplifying the financial instruments that are available for them in order to attract the required financing. So just remember, risk aversion may very well go up in the next year. Do not treat the current lull or the fact that we've had, uh, no, we have had no catastrophe in the developing world so far. We shouldn't uh, be complacent as a result of that. Uh, the Lehman Brothers collapsed more than a year after Bass Stearns collapsed. Be very wary about lulls in global financial markets and use the lulls to fortify resources and to build resilience. Don't take chances on this. I do want to say as well that besides more capital, better multiplication of capital to attract private investment, um, we also, and, and also better complementarity between the MDBs, we have to think about the capital and leverage policies of the MDBs themselves and talking about them now collectively rather than individually. Basically, capital policy is too conservative in the MDB world. And it's partly a result of the credit rating agency's uh, norms. It's not hard science. In fact, it's largely been just norms and practices. And I, would, I, I think there's a strong case for the MDBs together to approach the issue based on the data available on past default rates, based on the special um, peculiar features of the MDBs as having preferred creditor status, to really engage in a discussion with the credit rating agencies so that we can again multiply capital more effectively. Debt restructuring uh, is an issue which has to be on the table quite going well beyond the DSSI, which was I think a initial and um, a temporary initiative, not something that's going to change long-term growth prospects at all. We have to think very seriously about debt restructuring and there the MDBs again may need to be creative. I can fully understand why the MDBs do not participate directly in debt restructuring exercises. But there may be ways in which the MDBs could use their balance sheets to mitigate risk for private sector creditors when they are debt restructuring exercises. In other words, to provide some forms of guarantees on future payments uh, by developing country borrowers to private creditors. We have to be creative, but frankly, if you look at what's being done domestically, in a whole range of countries, if you look at the advanced countries, uh, they have not just been created, but they pulled out all the stops and uh, changed all the basic principles, both in fiscal and monetary policy. So modest innovations in MDB uh, financing, in MDB risk mitigation of the private sector, modest innovations can go a long way. Finally, I hope COVID has made global shareholders more aware of the importance of the global commons. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's stark what has happened. What has happened is, was not unpredictable. In fact, it was entirely, it wasn't just predictable, but there were predictions, not necessarily coronavirus, but there were predictions of a major new pandemic. And it may well be that the really big one hasn't yet come. The scientists have to be taken seriously. Um, and it is not just fancy, intellectual thinking, but there's a lot of hard science pointing to the fact that we're going to get a recurrence of pandemics or outbreaks of infectious diseases on a global scale in the years to come. And we have to think very seriously of how we can fortify the global commons in health, in education as well, which is a greatly neglected area. And of course, on everything to do with climate and the ecological crisis uh, the world is facing. So I'll stop there. I'm sorry if I've spoken for too long, uh, but I thought I'll just lay out the broad issues before us. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for emphasizing, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the gravity of the situation and the urgency of, of, of what we have to do and, and, and pointing to various options that we have in, 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 
in mobilizing the system and, and also getting private and particularly institutional capital into, into um, development. And also for warning us not to take this law um, uh, with complacency and rather use it as a time to, to build the defenses. Thank you very much. So, so uh, the next speaker is um, my boss, <laughs> President uh, Jin Li Chin. Um, He's been leading uh, the AIB since its start. And um, AIB, of course, is a newcomer among the multilateral development banks. And he was created very much to try to learn from the lessons from previous um, or from existing uh, institutions. Uh, President Jin has a long career as an official in the Ministry of Finance in China, but he's also worked in the World Bank, in the Asian Development Bank. He served as chairman of the China Investment Corporation and later at the China International Capital Corporation. As I said, I have the pleasure of working with President Jin now, but for this purpose tonight, I'm sitting in a separate office to protect my independence as, as a moderator. But um, seriously, President Jin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, Tamen, very nice to see you. Um, it's a long time, as we said, you know, uh, almost uh, more than a year now. But thank you very much for your uh, comments, uh, thoughtful ideas on a number of issues facing the world today. Uh, let, let me share with you briefly uh, our thoughts um, about uh, uh, the multilateralism, the governance, and the cooperation among all of the MDBs. I would say the COVID-19 pandemic is a litmus test to the AIB, uh, which is uh, barely four years into operation at the time when the COVID-19 broke out. Uh, the bank is based on the uh, principle of multilateralism. And we have, we started from the 57 founding members now there are 103 members and more than 80 countries have ratified uh, the Arctic Agreement. Uh, the latest is Brazil. Uh, Brazil uh, was a little bit late uh, because of domestic issues, but no, finally it's a member now. And uh, we have members from across the world in North America, uh, South America, Africa, Asia, Central Asia, and also Europe. So we are truly a multilateral institution. I would say this uh, bank was created by, initiated by China, and there was lots of skepticism about China's intention of creating such a bank. Uh, was this to be a bank dominated by China, uh, interested in uh, carrying out uh, its mission of international influence, or uh, it is dedicated to improve the uh, multilateralism, to strengthen the international financial economic uh, uh, system and the governance. I, I'm pleased to say that uh, now, at the, before, the, before we reach the end of the first five years, I think more and more countries uh, recognize uh, AIB is truly a multilateral institution. And its governance is based on experience of the existing uh, MDBs, but also with its new creative feature. And the during the pandemic uh, time, we have very good cooperation with other MDBs, so that with the combined resources, the MDBs could make a difference in controlling uh, the pandemic. So we are very pleased to have the opportunity to work with other MDBs, IFIs, and all the, also the private sector. Uh, the current situation alerted us to the risk of focusing exclusively on physical infrastructure to the neglect of social infrastructure. And healthcare turns out to be the weakest link in the production chain of the economy. So we would like to uh, pay attention to the development of healthcare sector, or we call it social infrastructure sector moving forward. And there should be a proper balance 
between the physical infrastructure development and uh, social infrastructure. As you see, healthcare is such an important part uh, of the economy. When we see the, the train service, the airline service, and all those entertainment services are almost deserted. Now you will find how important it is to make sure we could, we should be able to deal with the healthcare problems. Otherwise, all these physical in infrastructures built would be simply useless. Uh, it takes a little bit time for, for people to reach consensus on this issue. Uh, some people interpret the mandate of this bank in a very narrow sense. They say, well, the bank is to promote connectivity, infrastructure. But I say, but if you look at the, because I was involved in the uh, drafting of the Arctic Agreement from day one. So actually I was the one who added very important uh, concept in the mandate of this bank. We promote, the mandate is to promote broad-based economic and social development through investment in infrastructure and other productive sectors. At the time when we try to uh, propel the Arctic Agreement, some people ask me the question, Mr. Jin, what do you mean by other productive sectors? We are supposed to, to finance infrastructure connectivity. And my answer is other productive sectors means other productive sectors. So we leave a very broad scope for the bank's operations. Now it turns out that this is truly very important. I think what matters is the balance. How should we allocate appropriate amount of resources to social infrastructure? And, and also at a time when we negotiated the Arctic Agreement, um, we, we talked about IT, but probably digital economy did not feature prominently in those days. And now we all understand digital economy is so important for us. At a time, climate change was certainly a major concern for international community. But four years later, and as you know, the bank was set up right after the Paris Agreement was agreed upon. So the sense of awareness of climate change was there. However, the urgency of dealing with climate change was getting more and more serious. So my view is that climate change, drastic weather, and all this environmental degradation may combine to create the breeding ground for bacteria and virus or viruses. While there's no scientific evidence suggesting the close link between climate change and viruses. We have a reason to believe that uh, drastic weather, environmental degradation, disorder of ecosystem are bad for healthcare, for the human, for the human beings. And there are lots of evidence indicating the, <coughs> the linkage uh, between the animals, other species and the humans, the so-called zoonotic uh, kind of plague. So we believe it's very much important for us to deal with climate change. And when we, uh, when we draft the uh, corporate strategy, which was approved by the board not long ago, we indicated the bank would aim at achieving 50% of the financing for climate by 20. 25. So this is very much ambitious um, program, but we are very much encouraged to hear that Chinese President Xi Jinping declared that China would peak out in carbon emission by 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality by 2060, 10 years after the, the, the European countries, OECD countries. So the bank uh, is now working very closely with the other MDBs, governments,
private sector to deal with COVID-19. But once the COVID-19 is brought under control, we will go back to the normal mainstream business. But still, certain amount of resources will be devoted to digital economy, healthcare, and education. Not the general education, but education which would uh, help the younger people to fit into the new labor market when AI uh, would be playing a more important role. Uh, uh, Tommy, you, you, uh, you refer to the risk aversion issue. I know this is the time when the private sector uh, is really very much risk averse and almost for uh, during each uh, decade cycle, 1997, 2008, and Every 10 years when we were faced with, uh, uh, with the financial crisis, economic crisis, the private sector also would bear the brunt and the suffer losses. So this time, I think the big issue faced by the private sector is different from the normal business cycle because normal business cycle economists uh, would, be, would not find it very difficult with the data to calculate how soon the economies would be moving out of the woods. This time, it's not so, because this, this is not part of the normal business cycle. You cannot make very precise predictions about the recovery of the economies unless you know when COVID-19 pandemic could be brought under control. If it's uncertain, if there's no availability of safe and effective vaccine, this is going to trouble the world economy on and on and on. So the issue faced by the economists is not an economic issue. It's really very complicated social issue. That is why it's very hard for us to predict when we can go back to the normal businesses. But our idea is as soon as we are back to normal, we will go back to our mainstream business of physical infrastructure investment, but we'll also allocate sufficient amount of resources for social infrastructure. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for emphasizing, you know, the multilateral nature of AIB. Um, it's increasing, uh, importance that uh, you attach to, to social infrastructure and particularly to health. And I think this is something that comes very much out of, of course, the lessons from, from COVID and, and uh, this, these connections between infrastructures of, of different types, um, very much uh, important to remember. So thank you uh, for that. The, the next speaker is uh, Ksenia Yodaiba. She's the first deputy governor of the Central Bank of, of Russia. Uh, she joined uh, the ministry or the, um, the central bank from uh, having worked in the presidential administration, was central to the um, uh, G20 uh, presidency of, of Russia and, and played a key role in making that uh, a success. She has also been uh, in the Ministry of Economic Development and worked in research and, and, and think tanks. So thank you very much, Xenia. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, let me speak about some different topic because as I represent the um, central bank, uh, so I'll speak about topics which concern central banks and maybe we'll see some links. Uh, between uh, what uh, challenges for the central banks and MDBs. Uh, and of course, there were many challenges this year. It's definitely health challenge, economic, uh, but financial stability is also one of the most important challenges of this year. We all remember huge market volatility back in March. Uh, now it seems to be the second uh, wave, maybe not that big so far, but um, definitely uh, we see that volatility is rising on the financial markets. Uh, so uh, basically uh, what we see is that the change in the market architecture in the last 10 years, uh, the shift from uh, banks, which actually became more stable after all the reforms, 
uh, toward asset managers of various kind, uh, may mar uh, made markets somewhat more fragile. Uh, and, but at the same time, central banks do not uh, have or cannot use um, traditional lender of last resort tools to stabilize the system. So we see more and more interventions uh, of uh, central banks in different areas. Look at the Fed. Fed announced a number of new instruments of basically direct interventions on the markets, on primary markets rather than secondary market. If we look on the um, emerging markets, there there are more and more talks about QEs on emerging markets, which is interventions on government bond markets and uh, sometimes uh, other markets. Um, as well. And uh, so far, it mostly concerns liquidity issues, but further ahead, we will probably see more solvency issues, and it's still unclear how the system will uh, work uh, when we approach uh, that, that stage. Uh, and uh, what worries me is that on the one hand, uh, we see these uh, huge interventions by the central banks and well, as a central bank, bank I'm also worried that uh, we, um, in one way or another, see a revival of central bank financing of governments. While some forms of QEs look this way and we already saw outright examples of, of this. So. Mm, this idea is, um, well, it's not yet getting more and more popular, but it's not anymore considered as a taboo, um, right? That central bank cannot um, directly finance governments and not on, and uh, it's in different types of countries. On the other hand, if we look on the uh, on how countries use a global safety net, uh, we will see a very interesting picture. Well, at the very beginning, when there were all those liquidity problems, um, some emerging countries, emerging market countries, use Fed swap lines. IMF facilities were used much less, if at all, uh, for those countries who are eligible. Now IMF, of course, distributed a significant amount of money to a large number of countries, but among them, uh, well, with the exception of Argentina, you won't see any single kind of relatively large or important emerging market country. These are usually a poorer countries than uh, co emerging market countries. Emerging market countries usually look for um, domestic financing, and those of them, of course, who have a more developed domestic financial markets, they were able to finance they need um, domestically. But again, as I say, this idea of central bank uh, financing is uh, seem to be floating in the air. Uh, so um, for, to my mind, this basically means that uh, this whole global risk sharing scheme does not work uh, to the extent where it should work, uh, probably. And uh, maybe there is a bigger place, a big role here for uh, MDBs. I understand that many MDBs, of course, now are very active, right? uh in in this area maybe there's a bigger role for them maybe we should think about uh sort of um changing role uh, of other uh of the core institutions like the imf as well but um the 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 system seems uh right now multiply financial stability risks uh in some cases and these significant financial stability risks they prevent uh, government abilities to solve the economic problem. Uh, and this is a deficiency of the system which we probably need to think how to address in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senya. Thank you for, for bringing out uh, financial stability. We know that, that 
the financial crisis can quickly lose uh, many decades of, or at least many years of, of uh, development achievements and, and we point to some of these risks. And, and of course, many of us have been surprised <coughs> how markets have tolerated some of these or how have even welcomed some of these uh, sort of non-orthodox um, monetary policies in, 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 in emerging and developing economies. So I think there is there are a lot of question marks out there, you know, to what extent is this um, uh, sustainable or, or not. So thank you for, for bringing that up. The, the, um, the last, but by no means least, uh, speaker is, is uh, Arvind Sabramanian. He very recently resigned from his uh, post as the chief economic advisor to the Indian government. He has a long uh, career as an economist uh, at the IMF and a, a strong interest not only in his own country's economy, but also in, in that of China and in the global economic system have contributed in many ways to, to, uh, to the uh, international uh, thinking about uh, the global system. So please, Arvin, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, Eric, first of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me uh, to see uh, CEPR and LSC for inviting me. And of course, it's such a great privilege to be on such a, a distinguished panel uh, with my friend Tarman and President Jin and uh, Kisnea. Uh, I think uh, we've had a set of very, very thoughtful presentations. Um, uh, Tarman laid out the need for urgency. Uh, President Jin spoke about um, uh, uh, the contribution, the terrific contribution that AIIB is making. And, and we have also heard about the challenges of central banks. Um, I want to uh, step back from all of this and kind of take a slightly big picture view, uh, a, a more candid, uh, a more stark, uh, and uh, I'm very sorry, I want to apologize in advance for a much more grim uh, and pessimistic assessment of where we are today. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be a kind of party spoiler uh, and I apologize in advance for that. So, so let, let's just, I think, uh, honestly and realistically take stock of you know, how we got here. And let me kind of compress the history uh, to begin by saying there was a kind of status quo ante, uh, which I think is reflected in uh, Tharman's uh, G20 EPG report. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, I mean, the history compressed is as follows, that, you know, we had a period where you know, the West was doing very well. And then from about, you know, 70s, 80s onward, uh, uh, the rest, especially in East Asia, developing countries were rising. And then, uh, you know, especially China. Uh, and then what happened was, in some ways, the Western uh, donors committed the original sin of not adapting the West-led institutions, you know, the World Bank, IMF, MDBs, did not adapt it commensurate with the rise uh, of, of the uh, East Asian countries, uh, commensurate with the changing economic realities. So that was the heart of the problem going back, you know, whether it was quota, voice, governance, etc. You know, we had the same uh, leaders uh, from the same bunch of countries and the same institutions, you know, very little uh, a uh, very little real accommodation <clears throat> of the changing economic realities. You know, the West did not respond very well to the rise of the rest, uh, and that was the original sin. Then what happened, of course, was uh, the rising hegemon, China, uh, uh, responded as you would expect any hegemon to respond. It created uh, a set of new institutions, mostly in the development sphere, not quite you know, in the IMF emergency liquidity sphere. Uh, and so it, you know, we saw the BRI, we saw the AIIB, the new development bank. Um, and so a new uh, a set of institutions were created. Uh, and uh, to be honest, you know, the West participated with a kind of a, a, a range of uh, a response from enthusiasm on the part of some, to very reluctant tolerance acquiescence on the part of the other. So that's where we were. We had the original sin. We had the response of China. 
And in a sense, that was the status quo ante, which is reflected in Tarman's G20 report. Essentially, we went from a monopoly of this whole international financial institutions to a kind of competition, a kind of desirable competition, uh, and then with kind of some exhortations of, you know, we must all uh, cooperate, it must be coherent, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that was the kind of status quo model, you know, from monopoly to a kind of competition in this uh, in this sphere of providing this global public good of, you know, finance, development finance, emergency liquidity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, and this is the crux of what I'm going to say, I mean, the world changed. Um, the competition model, the, you know, I think was a, a, not a bad model and it could work in good times because, you know, borrowers could then shop around, you know, uh, should I go to the bank? Oh my God, they have these onerous procedures. You know, let me go to the AIIB, you know, and there was this, you know, almost desirable competition, which I think you could argue benefited borrowers uh, in some sense, you know, the AIIB, BRI, focused, they had this expertise building infrastructure, you know, uh, World Bank did something else, they had you know, better government procurement practices maybe, uh, and so this kind of competition model, <clears throat> uh, you know, kind of was where we were. Then COVID hit, um, and what it demonstrated, I think what the COVID crisis demonstrates is that this model of going from monopoly to competition cannot really work. It cannot really work uh, for two reasons. One, you know, in, in the good times you have this competition, but in the bad times <clears throat> you require, you know, debt write-offs, reductions, basically burden sharing amongst the creditors. And, you know, now there are a whole bunch of creditors uh, and that burden sharing requires cooperation, a lot of cooperation between new multiple varied actors, multilateral, bilateral, official, private, et cetera. So, so point number one is that the competition model can work for the good times. Uh, I think in the bad times, you know, it, it uh, uh, cannot work or hasn't worked so far. The second big reason why it can't work, I think, and we really have to come to grips with this when we think about cooperation going forward, is that we don't have a, the old, you know, G2 world where there are two, you know, hegemons who are kind of uh, providing global public goods, who are kind of cooperating with each other. Uh, and I'm going to be a little provocative here and say, we're almost not in a G2 world, but in a G minus two world where you know, cooperation is going to become uh, a very, very difficult. So we're in bad times where you need more cooperation on burden sharing, you know, debt write-offs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and but that cooperation because of this new geopolitical world that we're in is going to be uh, much more difficult uh, than before. Now, let me just elaborate on the bad times. I think we know, and I think Tarman made this point very well, and President Jin as well, that you know the poorer countries are going to require flow relief uh, and probably a lot of stock relief as well. So, I mean, in a sense, I think we have to uh, come to grips with the fact that you know the whole. If even if you look at debt export ratios for a la large bunch of developing countries, they have started moving adversely, not just post COVID. Uh, but, you know, post-global financial crisis, you know, as commodity prices came down, as the world started slowing down, exports declined, deglobalization happened. Uh, so the outlook started deteriorating even before COVID. And, and now, of course, COVID, uh, as, uh, as several of you pointed out, is going to, you know, the magnitude that's going to be required, uh, uh, not just flow relief, but also stock relief, you know, whatever debt write-offs, it's going to be huge. I think it's fair to say that so far, the multilaterals, I think, have only made a very modest contribution, uh, you know, whether it's the G20 or, or the World Bank. Uh, there's a paper by uh, Justin Sandifer and Scott Morris, which shows that the World Bank, you know, even relative to its own targets for COVID is falling far short. Um, and, uh, you know, the IMF has done something. Uh, but I think it's not really been tested. I think if Carmen and others are right about, you know, defaults uh, coming in the future, I, I think the, uh, the whole system, including uh, the IMF, is going to be tested. So that's on the multilateral front. Uh, 
on the bilateral front, you know, it's not clear to me that, you know, China has come out looking uh, very good either on the bilaterals. You know, uh, I can't say for sure. We can't say for sure. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, whether there have actually been write-offs, reductions, how much, we just don't know. But one doesn't get the sense that in the bad times, you know, the bilaterals have been um, uh, terribly, uh, you know, responsive uh, either. Now, the point is that the, the competition model, basically what it did was it created many more actors, you know, in this development lending space. You know, whereas we have the private sector, we have China bilateral, we have other multilaterals at AIIB. And the truth is there is no mechanism of any sort on burden sharing. There's not even a shred of convergence on the need for this uh, cooperation, let alone principles. And, you know, we don't even know the magnitudes involved. You know, we don't know, for example, what all the bilateral debt is from many of the major uh, official creditors, including China. So, so in a sense, the kind of burden sharing in bad times uh, is a bit of a mess, really, if we're honest about this. Um, now we come to the G minus two world. So we need more cooperation, uh, but you know, the world has become a less cooperative place. I mean, this is not the time to go into you know, what uh, the two hegemons are doing. Uh, I think we know what's been happening in the last few years uh, in, in the United States. I mean, uh, this is not a, a country, a hegemon that's supplying the Charlie Kindleberger goods, you know, or more finance, more open markets, or more cooperation. You know, you know, in the last few years, the, uh, the US has been doing uh, exactly the opposite. Uh, so that's why. And, and the puzzle for me is, you know, uh, uh, is China as well. I think it had a historic opportunity uh, to fill the kind of leadership vacuum of the West, but it's not clear that you know that is happening. You know, uh, I wrote a piece saying, you know, uh, the soft power that you know China was rightly trying to accumulate with the BRI, uh, with the AIIB, and so on. You know. Uh, it's not clear what uh, uh, they have done in the bad times in terms of debt reduction, debt write-offs, you know, less onerous terms of borrowing. I think it's an open question. Um, and I, I also felt that China could have done much more in terms of actually using its reserves to provide emergency liquidity, kind of to almost compete with or complement, uh, you know, the IMF and central banks. So I think when we step back and look at, at, at the... Uh, you know, geopolitical uh, see, uh, scene. I think today, you know, cooperation is is is, is a complete, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, very very difficult situation we're in. So I think looking ahead, the hope is: can we go back to kind of the status quo ante? You know, uh, in a post-Trump world where the uh, you know the, the climate for cooperation uh, becomes better. You know. Uh, clearly, I mean, it's possible that with the Biden administration, you know, the U.S. will rejoin the Paris uh, Agreement on climate change, uh, go, go back to the WHO, it will cut, re remove some of the restrictions on immigration and trade, and then, you know, we can think about um, a better cooperation, a better climate for cooperation uh, globally. Uh, but a, a part of me hopes that will happen, but the truth is I have no confidence because I think the status quo that underlay even the G20 report of, of Tharman seems to be a little bit uh, uh, out of date and untenable because broadly, I, I don't think the, you know, the China-US rivalry is going away. Uh, I, I think attitudes towards China for right or wrong are hardening across the world and we've seen the latest uh, Pew survey. So I just see uh, an international system that's going to be highly unstable, highly uncooperative, and highly conflict prone. And the truth is, you know, uh, there is no committee to save the world. Uh, and uh, I really, really sad to say, I don't see one emerging uh, in, in, in the near future, given the broader geopolitical climate we're in, uh, and given all that we've seen so far. So with apologies for being uh, dark and, and gloomy, uh, let me conclude on that note. Thank you very much, Arvin. This is a, a very fair, I think, uh, challenge to, to the kind of complacency that uh, we, we might be lulled into by talking about um, uh, the need for a system 
to work more as a system when there are these fundamental uh, uh, tension in the in the system and between key players in the system. And um, I very much agree with you that in 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 bad times, this co this competition model doesn't work. And I, I I even question that it's very healthy in good times because you know we we are as we said from the very beginning, these are institutions that are owned more or less by the same shareholders, the same taxpayers are paying for this. Is that really, um, are we gonna compete? You know, what are we competing against? So I think there are some very fundamental questions. So I'm gonna now, uh, I think what you said now, I think we should get uh, some responses from, from the rest of the panelists, because I think it is uh, a, a challenge to what was said earlier. I was going to bring in a, a student actually, because this is a tradition we have, and the student happens to have th think uh, very much about um, the this. The, his question is very much in the spirit of what um, Arvin was saying. So, can I ask uh, uh, Jin Tao Zhu, who is a PPE student from the London School of Economics? Um, Jin Tao, can you ask your question? Uh, thank you, Eric. And thank you all the panelists. So uh, I think my question is, is on the, the relation between MDBs and individual countries. So I want to ask the panelists, how do you evaluate the current cooperation between MDBs and individual countries? Are there any existing challenge or gap that stop us from achieving uh, maximum efficiency? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Din Tao. So I think with, with that question, I'll, I'll Maybe let Tharman come in and, and um, maybe you, you can respond to Arvind and maybe also this issue of the multilateral bilateral competition and the, the role of individual countries in these multilateral institutions. Tharman. Thank you. Um, let me um, reflect on um, what Arvind was saying. Um, I think Arvind was uh, uh, accurately describing the way the world has evolved, the fact that you now have a multiplicity of actors with some fragmentation um, and some uh, competition uh, involving uh, shareholders. Um, fundamentally, um, we have to decide on what uh, process of change uh, is conceivable and achievable. And uh, I would say, uh, if I were to put it academically, we need a theory of change. There is a status quo at every point of time. And the question is how we move from today's status quo which I think has existed for roughly 10 years or so, um, to a new, more cooperative international order. And I think, you know, my theory of change and my motivation as a policymaker is to think in terms of transition. And I say this not just rhetorically or, you know, because it's a nice, uh, nice way of putting it. I say it very seriously because we have only three alternatives, you see. One alternative is wait for things to play out so that the rebalancing of global um, influence um, uh, is given time to settle into a new equilibrium. Um, unfortunately, that takes a long time. Uh, existing hegemonies do not fade quickly. They fade slowly, they fade stubbornly, um, before finally accepting a new equilibrium with new emerging powers. That's been history written all through <laughs> the last century. Um, and certainly uh, there's nothing in current day geopolitics which suggests that it's going to be achieved faster. It's contestation, it's, it's uh, both the competition and collaboration, but you know, that it's, it's, it's a messy business. It's going to take time and we cannot afford to wait because the demographics and the development needs of the developing world have an urgency that even those of us, even those who are not in a, 
uh, policy um, actor role uh, have from a humanistic point of view uh, have to accept that, look, we have to fix this quickly and we can't wait for the geopolitics to adjust and for better minds and, and better wisdom to emerge. Second, so that's one option, takes too long. Second option is allow for COVID type crises, global financial crises uh, with a dysfunctional international system, allow for them to have their negative effects. In other words, let the system be run to the ground so that leaders basically realize that, look, this is serious and we've got to cooperate with each other to build a new world, a new world order. Unfortunately, there too, that can happen quickly, but there too, the cost is just too severe. We cannot, from a, with, with good conscience, allow for that to happen. So the transition alternative of transiting from one state of affairs, dysfunctional, I would say not completely broken, by the way. It's not broken, but it's dysfunctional. It's fragmented, it's dysfunctional, and it's overlapping. Transiting from that world to a new world, to my mind, requires focusing on a few key actions which are doable. They still require leadership, which is still a little lacking, but they are doable. And you hope as you go along that you don't breed complacency and a rosy, uh, a sort of rose-tinted view of the world, but you breed momentum. And that's my theory of change, that move forward, show the benefits of mutual cooperation, the benefits of mutual investment, and show that mutual interest is a reality. It's not rhetorical, it's a reality. There is such a thing as mutual interest between the US and China, between the developed and developing world, there is such a thing. It's, it's an, you can show that the benefits exceed what you're giving each other. If you can show that by taking steps forward and leaders who are national leaders recognize that their workers, their firms, their economies are benefiting, I think it can build momentum. Not by, because it's an economic law, not because it's a, a certainty, but there's a better chance there's a better chance. So I don't uh, disagree with the, the, the picture that Arvind was, was very usefully painting in very bold strokes. I, I asked myself, okay, what's the way forward? And to my mind, there are only three options and only one is from the point of view of um, what we should be doing morally, but also from the point of view of what we can do realistically to reach a new equilibrium I think it's the world of working on transition. And that's the world that will best, that approach of working on transition, using the MDBs as catalytic agents, using the development finance corporations, using the hybrid institutions, using the private sector, which is the most resources. That involves doable actions. It's not pie in the sky, it is doable. It is moving a little too slowly Frankly, what happens in one or two countries uh, is going to be critical. I don't need to elaborate too much. It's going to be critical. It's not going to change the world. It's not going to take us immediately onto the, um, the sunlit uplands, but it takes us forward and it can create momentum. President Tin, can I yeah. ask you? Uh, let, let me very briefly talking about the cooperation. Uh, among the MDBs and also the cooperation between uh, the countries, client countries and MDBs. First of all, uh, I would like to say MDBs are different from the private sector companies. So among the MDBs, cooperation has always been the norm. If there's any competition, and this com competition uh, goes in the way of trying to do better, not by, for instance, a race to a racing to the bottom. Uh, we do not compete with each other. We don't steal the project from the from the pipeline of one uh, MDB to another. We don't do that. And uh, the during the bad times such as this, it's all the more important for MDBs to work together to leverage our resources to deal with uh, the pandemic. For instance, we cooperate with World Bank and. Uh, ADB to provide resources to the client countries. We do not have the macroeconomic 
uh, uh, programs for all those countries. And we don't provide the budget to support and the policy lending. We don't do that. But under the special circumstances, it's important for us to provide uh, resources to these countries so that they can deal with the pandemic. And we work with the World Bank, ADB, co-finance with them. We take advantage of their uh, experts, uh, expertise in dealing with the macro issues. And they certainly benefit from, from the uh, pitching in of, of our bank. So we are doing very well. And since the MDBs have to observe the same standards, safeguard standards, environmental protection, resettlement, and all those kind of very, very important safeguard policies, we can work together, we can cooperate. So racing to the bottom is not something which has happened uh, among the relationship of the MDBs. With regard to the relationship of MDBs with the client countries, I think uh, uh, we, we've been doing very well uh, working with them and uh, the developing countries uh, really embrace the MDBs and we uh, think their understanding of the governance standards, of the safeguard policies, of the high standards we uphold uh, is very important for them. We do not like excessive conditionality but there must be some standards you have to follow. Otherwise the money may not do its right job, right? So we simply cannot give the money to, to anyone. And uh, as long as you pay us back, it's fine. This is not the way we do business. We want to make sure uh, there's no corruption. The money goes right, go to the right place, doing the right job and do it effectively. So by working together, following the same standards, we can enforce the discipline and developing countries understand that actually long-term it's going to do them great service. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was gonna bring in a, a question from the audience here. I don't know if, if uh, Kurt, Kurt Beyer is, is, Kurt, can you? Yeah. Okay. You have a lot of experience from, from these uh, multilateral development banks. So please ask your question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Eric. And thanks a lot to the panel. I think this is a very interesting discussion. I would like to bring up a more conceptual issue. Uh, some of the panelists have uh, asked for, and I think I agree to some extent, to bring in more private sector capital. But we do know, of course, uh, that the private sector very often is very volatile. We do know that more capital, more private sector capital is flowing out of developing countries, especially in Africa, but also other regions and stays in there and, and goes in. So as long as we promote private sector uh, participation, we always have the risk that we create financial instabilities in these countries. And of course, also that more, no more capital leaves the, the region than actually is necessary. So I'm always, I've always been a great adherent and uh, promoter of MDBs because they stay uh, longer and they have more of a commitment because they're public sector run banks essentially. Uh, but if we cannot uh, prevent private capital from leaving LDCs going into safe havens and going into uh, tax havens, I think we have a big problem and that's something that MDBs also have to start to work on more aggressively. Thank you. Eric, Thank may you. I respond to this question briefly? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's very much important for the MDBs to, to work with the private sector companies. And we do believe um, involving the private sec uh, sector and leveraging our resources can do more for the developing countries than for us to work alone. And when we work private sector companies, this is not going to add pressure on the government's balance sheet. It depends on the project sponsors to take care of their own profits and losses. Now, when we work with the private sector, it is not something uh, as you, you talked about, because we invest in physical infrastructure. We, even though they provide lending, not equity investment, it's the money they provide to them 
and the so-called term uh, loans, they will not be able to pull out if they see something is happening. So it's different from the hard money, the private sector resources we in MDB try to leverage is the money which stays stable. And this is exactly the resources which could help the developing countries in times of difficulty. That is why our job is to work with the developing countries to prepare very good investment projects for the money to come and to stay. That's why we are different from the uh, investment banks, from some of the financial institutions, private sector institutions. They come and go, and they will just go to anywhere where they, they, they can make quick bucks. This is not happening uh, just because of our involvement. Thank you. Uh, Eric, can I come in? Yes, Arvind, yes, please. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I want to say uh, two sets of things. One is uh, this very important point uh, that's been raised. Um, uh, I think, you know, point number one, uh, I think there's a major responsibility on the borrowing countries themselves uh, to create the conditions and institutions to be best able to harness you know, private capital flows. Uh, so so uh, I, I don't think countries, borrowing countries are exempt from that uh, responsibility because there is a sense in which you know, private capital can be more volatile uh, and so on. But, but here too, I want to you know, come back to an, a very important point, uh, which is that even with private capital, all the focus so far has been, you know, on the going in in the good times, how do we harness them? But what the COVID crisis has shown is that we need to think about, you know, the private sector also in the bad times when we have to do the burden sharing. And I think that's something so... In a sense, the bad times problem is complicated, not just because we have a, a private creditors, uh, official creditors, new official creditors, but also the competition model over the last 10 years meant that much more capital, private capital has gone in. So then the whole burden sharing question is going to involve the private sector as well. And uh, frankly, you know, uh, apart from, you know, the, the old Ann Kruger thing went nowhere. And I think we haven't just focused enough on, you know, that dimension of, you know, uh, uh, you know, cooperation in the bad times, which kind of brings me to, you know, uh, the way I'd like, uh, I mean, I kind of completely agree with Tarman's, you know, uh, theory of change. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, you know, uh, Bertolt Brecht or someone said, or Samuel Beckett, you know, uh, we can't go on, we must go on. And, you know, I, I think there is that sense in which, yeah, we must go on. But I think that <clears throat> my frustration a little bit with the discussion is that uh, we tend to brush some of these big things under the carpet and therefore sometimes don't you know focus on you know uh, you know our, our kind of litany of things to do sometimes misses some obvious things you know like for example this whole burden sharing uh, debt reduction sdrm you know those discussions now i'm afraid involving china uh, chinese official and uh, private creditors and bringing the whole system together, they have to be front and center, for example, now. I mean, we can no longer say, you know, these are not important. We can't just focus on the good times. So, so yes, we need to act, but I think with a, informed by uh, A, aware of the deeper structural problems and what those mean for realistic proposals, uh, uh, both the nature and feasibility going forward. Thank you. Arvind, please. Please. Yeah, please. So just to follow on from what President Jin Lee Chun and Arvin have uh, said, um, it's a very important question that was posed, and I'll make the following points. First, uh, the um, immediate suggestion about um, having some form of, um, let's just call it capital controls, uh, to prevent outflows. Uh, that's probably not the best tool to use, and the weight of evidence suggests that um, one can possibly use macro prudential policy to influence the type of capital inflows you get. 
which so they are so as to discourage um, uh, fickle uh, inflows, but it is usually counterproductive to try and impose controls on outflows. But let's just do away with that and address the broader issues that the question raises. I think there's no realistic scenario um, uh, for there to be anywhere near adequate finance or even a fraction of the adequate finance coming out of the public sector. We need domestic resource mobilization. We need uh, uh, the world to recognize mutual interest and to provide adequate capital, both for the global commons as well as the MDBs and the IMF. But even then, when you add it all up together, it is far short of the scale required to finance the development needs of Africa, South Asia, Latin America. The, the quantums we're talking about vastly exceed what the public sector, what the global public sector can provide. So the question is, how do we attract the right scale and type of private investment? And what was uh, just being said by President Jin Li Chun and Arvind in a way is, um, uh, you know, there's, there's a way in which, I mean, let me put it another way. Why is it that some developing countries face less of this problem than others? And I'm not talking about some extreme examples, but you know, there's a class of developing countries that face less of a problem of um, risk on, risk off, jittery private capital flows than others. And there's a combination of factors. First, composition of private finance. The larger the proportion of foreign direct investment and project finance compared to portfolio investments, the more stable the situation is likely to be. Second, the stronger the development of local currency, domestic capital markets, including for portfolio investment, and that better balance between local and foreign or global capital markets, the more stable the situation is likely to be. You'll still run into trouble, but at least you've got some diversification and you've got a broader range of investors. Thirdly, you need less risk in your own investment environment. And that's a very complicated business because the developing world is often unfairly rated. And that's why the MDBs are critical. And that's why many of the proposals, by the way, in the G20 EPG report are precisely about running the system as a system so as to diversify risk for private investors, including even the portfolio investors, so that they don't need to run from country A whenever there's the slightest hint of problems, because they're holding a portfolio comprising country A, B, C, D, E. And that basic principle of financial diversification hasn't been adequately exploited when it comes to developing country infrastructure investment, the idea of pooling assets into synthetic asset classes. It is doable. Finally, uh, as Ksenia was talking about, we really need to plug the weaknesses in the global financial safety net. And that involves especially the IMF and the central banks, uh, central banking community. Again, it's entirely doable because you know, the idea of SDR issuance on a significant scale, not so different from what was done 12 years ago. The scale needs to be larger because the scale of the global economy is now much larger, but really not big, big bucks compared to what's being spent domestically not very complex in terms of the mechanics and the instruments required to ensure that there's a transfer of SDRs from the developed countries to the developing countries most in need. It's entirely doable. The idea of having a tying up of different safety nets that are in play today, the IMF, the regional safety nets, not greatly complex. So many of these things are doable. So I would say you know, none of us should think in status quo terms. We should all be thinking about what's the next reasonably bold step forward. And if there's an objection, if there's a if there's a uh, a lack of political commitment, you've got to work on it. I am. I do not feel the situation is hopeless, but it requires more leadership. It requires a bit more thinking as to what's even in the national interest of each of the major shareholder countries and what's in their national interests is a world that is more stable, a world where Africa doesn't go south, and it's a world in which adequate demand for the goods and products, goods and services that we all produce is still going to be there. The developing world is critical for the future of the global economy. Eric, 
Can yeah, can yes. Uh, so yeah. so I, I'll yet give you the floor. <clears throat> can I? Um, there is a question here from the audience that I you know maybe you can weave into your answer or your response. Uh, so it's about what you brought up uh, in part. The you know the sort of policies that have been pursued um, both by the systemically important or systemically um, influential uh, central banks, you know, the Fed, the ECB, and Bank of Japan. Yeah. You know, the questioner asked, Peter Goodman asks, you know, has this diminished the need for additional finance for middle-income countries? The fact that these very uh, expansive uh, uh, monetary policies often uh, supported by strong fiscal uh, efforts those uh, have that reduced the need for finance in middle income countries and he says also private creditors say similar reasons for why um, there is no need for debt suspension among the poorest countries what are we to make of this this is his question you can mm -hmm. first you know respond to 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 what uh, others have said and then maybe pick up this question as well Okay, uh, thank you very much. I would like to answer like several um, or well, reply to several things which were discussed. Uh, first of all, on capital flows, um, I agree that borrowing country can do a lot to improve its resilience. Uh, and actually, we um, invested a lot in, in this, and I think we uh, improved our resilience significantly in the last uh, five years. Uh, however, our capital flows will still be volatile because they depend very much, as you, Eric, said, and that was the last question uh, was referring to, to the policies of uh, home countries rather than host countries to a large extent, and they uh, react to these policies. And moreover, uh, some countries may become kind of victims of their own success because if they're very successful, they may attract too much capital flows and, and then at some point uh, face uh, too much volatility. So it's, it's a very, um, uh, it's it's a system uh, which um, requires kind of continuous management, and this is why we speak about uh, all kind of instruments, macroprudential instruments, etc. Uh, what I see actually is that with all those talks uh, about uh, capital controls, uh, and even IMF now is almost advising capital controls in some uh, circumstances. Uh, countries are less and less actually eager to implement them. We see more and more are not really controls, but rather intervention kind of response uh, in, in one way or another. It's, uh, as I said, it, it may be all kind of interventions on FX markets and FX liquidity markets and now on domestic uh, bond markets and, and, and so on. So this is uh, where we are moving to in this world of volatile uh, capital uh, inflows. Uh, speaking of the future, uh, as I said, and I think that part of this volatility is uh, due to shift to market-based finance. Uh, and I think that uh, in comparison to what happened 10 years ago, 10 years ago, there were lots of problems in the banking sector, so there were lots of reforms to improve the banking sector. Now, I think we will see lots of reform to improve this kind of sector. Uh, but uh, it uh, will be done to a large extent from uh, home country perspectives. So internationally, it may to some extent, not, not fully, but to some extent, increase fragmentation in the system. And in some cases, that's uh, where, how I see my role in some of the international organizations to prevent that. But I think that it may increase volatility of uh, international flows in, um, in some cases. Uh, and uh, maybe since we speak here about uh, multilateral um, development banks uh, and instruments which they use, maybe we should think more about instruments um, like 
whatever private public sector um, uh, PPPPs, right? Uh, some sort of combination of finances from private sector and uh, MDBs on, on conditions which make this kind of finance less volatile. I think for the future, this is the kind of financial engineering which may be needed in this area. Not the traditional financial engineering when you create an asset uh, which is marketable, but a new type which makes it less volatile at the same uh, time. On, on the other hand, I more than agree with Arvin that our immediate, immediate problem will be to a large extent uh, not well in addition to traditional problems like development finance is that restructuring and we do need to think about how to go smoothly uh, through this process particularly given how many different actors are involved into this process look on argentina right it's already going for a few number of uh, years and it's uh, well, I understand that political circumstances, they are complicated, but we will be dealing with that restructuring in politically and socially different, difficult environments. And this is a challenge which we do need to think how to uh, address for the future. And uh, we probably do need to think how to change the system in order to come up with the solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Xenia. We are coming to, to an end. Does anyone want to come in here? Uh, Arvind, you want to, yeah. Yeah, I, I think you know, this is just a, a, a broader point uh, that cannot be uh, emphasized enough, uh, which is that, you know, uh, as, as Tharman and all the others have rightly said, you know, um, the, the future of the world, uh, its stability, uh, you know, uh, uh, dealing with, you know, the, the next major challenges for the global commons, pandemics, climate change, uh, you know, migration, whatever, uh, they are going to uh, depend upon the fate of what I call the late convergers. You know, um, I, we had the West, which did very well. Then we had a bunch of, you know, the first generation of convergers, East Asian tigers, uh, et cetera. Then we had the second generation, China, to some extent, uh, India. But now there's a kind of, you know, whole bunch of countries that have not, you know, made as rapid strides, South Asia, Central Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Latin America. I, I, I think for these countries, you know, we must remember that in addition to the whole challenges of financing, which are going to be critical for both good times and bad times, which are going to be critical. I think having an open trading system or open markets uh, is going to be as critical, if not more critical for the fate of these countries. So I think that while we worry about, you know, financial flows, you know, we should also worry about, you know, worrying trends in deglobalization, you know, decline in uh, trade in goods and services possibly over time. And we must do everything, you know, uh, to ensure that, you know, the trading system, uh, the possibilities for trade of all kinds, goods, services, ideas, technology uh, remains as open as this, because without that, these late convergers have no chance of you know, even remotely doing what their predecessors in what one would call the convergence chain, uh, you know, quite magically and wonderfully and welcomingly achieved. That opportunity should be kept open uh, for the late convergers, which means finance, which we're talking about, but let's not also forget you know, the trading system, keeping it open uh, for all these countries. Can I just say that I, I think that's a very important point Arvin has made. Uh, which um, is uh, often neglected, and the current mood of, um, uh, you know, talking about how globalization has uh, reached its limits, and maybe even you need a bit of deglobalization, is not only um, uh, inaccurate, uh, but will be is seriously counterproductive. So it's a very important point: openness to trade, to investment of various kinds, 
uh, is fundamental to the future of the global economy. And, and actually, a lot of the globalization has actually made it easier for countries to come into, for example, global value chains because of the fragmentation of these chains. And you don't need to produce a whole car. You can come in with a small part. And we see maybe also now that the services are establishing the same kind of value chains. You, you also, countries can come in as service providers. And we know call centers, for example, but I think there are many more examples of this. So I think this point of Arvin is incredibly important. So I think we have had a, a, a very uh, stimulating and, and important discussion. I you should, as Thorman reminded us from the very beginning that we are facing a, an unprecedented shock, or at least a shock that we haven't seen to the system uh, for a very long time. And it puts us on, on another trajectory, as he described it. It's not only that we are losing um, uh, growth now, but we are also probably not going to pick up at the same rate because of, uh, as President Jin was emphasizing, the, the link between the medical emergency and uh, the rest of the economy. And so both in, in the crisis in particular, but also after, as we try to uh, uh, grow back better, we need to be very uh, conscious of, of this, you know, if we can't address the medical emergency, if we can't strengthen our health systems, if we can't improve uh, and, and, and get back those lost years of education that we see for so many uh, around the world. So I think those investments in social infrastructure will be extremely important as we, as we go forward. Uh, Xenia brought in uh, very importantly the financial stability aspect and of course, the eminent persons group, that was very much the, the, the starting point or that you, know, you cannot achieve financial development at the expense of financial stability. And of course, now we are seeing that there is very serious uh, potential problems in the system. Luckily, we learned some lessons from the previous financial crisis. So the banking systems have been more resilient, but we are going into a, a second phase now where we are likely to see liquidity issues turning into solvency issues in the financial system in different parts in the uh, real economy as well and you know we need to be prepared and we have spoken about the need to cooperate uh, coordinate resources uh, join balance sheets um, have coherence uh, across these institutions i think it's been a, a very stimulating night uh, a very late night here in in uh, in beijing and uh, i'm very grateful to president jean for staying with us for until so late and, and uh, also it's true also in Singapore so we are on the same time zone here but thank you everybody and th and I'm to the audience you have been uh, uh, asking a lot of questions I haven't been able to do justice to to all of them or most of them unfortunately but I hope you have um, enjoyed this um, uh, very interesting discussion thank you very much and and be safe